Happy Friday, everybody. Thanks for joining me today in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. Fans will recognize Gregory Zarian from his recent appearance in the third season of the HBO hit series Westworld, from his Emmy-nominated role on Venice the Series, from his recurring roles on BET's The Family Business, Days of Our Lives, General Hospital, and from his guest starring roles on Counterpart, Criminal Minds, Bones, Castle, Revenge, The Mentalist, Entourage, and so many more. Gregory can currently be seen in the new hostage thriller, 86 Melrose Avenue, which was released this past Tuesday. He won the Best Supporting Actor Award from the Overcome Film Festival for his performance in this movie. The movie is available today on video on demand platforms such as iTunes, Prime Video, Google Play, YouTube, and anywhere you stream movies. It's my pleasure to welcome to the locker room, Gregory Zarian. Gregory. Okay, that was fantastic. Did I do okay? Can, can, Anything, can, can you as do Rachel it? Maddow would say, did I get it all right? Okay, uh, <laughs> Alan, you got it so right. Could you call me every day and just do that? Because that <laughs> sure. I gotta, I gotta I'll, say. I'll, I'll, I'll wake you up, it'll be like your alarm. <laughs> uh, as an actor, you sometimes you go to audition, 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 and sometimes you kind of forget your paths, your past, and and what you've done. And it's uh, it was kind of cool to just really hear some of the great moments that I've been fortunate to be part of um, in this career that guarantees you nothing. So thank yeah. you for uh, Ser seriously. You even said it. You go on all those aud auditions, and you you know you walk out of there like this because. You really never know. You know, I said to you know, I some people don't really like this, but I uh, it's kind of I'm on the stripper pole every day, and yeah. I you know after uh, I saw the movie with Jennifer Lopez a couple of years ago. Yeah, hustle, she, hustler, hustle, hustler. She, you know, it made so much sense to me because you are really just dancing as fast as you can. You are. You know, one like one day you're spinning and you're great, and the next day you're getting hundreds, and the other days you're like, "Come on, I'm tired." And I say it out of, but I say it out of respect because it's a profession and you work really hard. And you know, I am on that pole every day, with all due respect. And I say that, you know, I, uh, you know, every day I am pounding the pavement, going to auditions, looking for the next job. And just because like I have this great movie out, doesn't mean that I'm not already looking to see what happens next. So it's- um, it, It's a great analogy, because you really are. I mean, you are hustling for that next, you know, as great as this moment is, and, and 86 Melrose is great. I was just telling you, it's, you know, I mean, it's a hostage thriller, and sadly, what we're living through in this country, it's so sort of, you know, the moment, really. You know, it is. I mean, look what just happened two days ago with with Derek Chauvin and George Floyd. I don't. We are polarized by this conversation of gun control, gun violence. Um, you know, what I think is so uh, what's so what's so fascinating about this film is last year when we fell into covid, we were all held hostage in our homes. You know, Ellen, I call it a global car crash. We were all, and what are you mm -hmm. gonna do? And, you know, as, as dramatic for some as it may sound, to me it's not, we were all fighting to stay alive. We didn't wanna get a virus, we didn't wanna die. We were in the unknown. So I really equate what happened last year to even this movie. You but know, it wasn't just the United States, it's around the world because the the world was in the same boat for the first time ever. Global a global pandemic. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's crazy, you know. How, how, talk, how, talk talk about your 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 role in the movie and, and talk about you know what drew you to the project. Um, but then I'm gonna come back and ask you a question about you and the pandemic because I think it's fascinating. Oh, sure. Yeah, okay. Share. Um <laughs> Uh, the movie, uh, I play a gentleman named Avi Shaheen. Uh, he, uh, he comes from a bit of money. You know, his, his father, his family's very, very old school. Uh, you know, I was very much brought up old school. My father came to this country with $15. 
um, he landed on Western and Sunset and saw a big bulletin board of um, half Armenian, half German. He saw this big bulletin board and it was an Armenian dentist. And my dad created the American dream. So my character uh, was born in the old country and my father wanted me to uh, kill people for land in the movie. You know, uh, I play an Israeli and uh, the lead actress plays a Lebanese Lebanese girl and they hate, they hate each other. So what drew me, drew me to the movie was, were the talking still, points. Still so relevant. You know what I'm saying? It is. Yeah. Like, I mean, even that, that, that's just an aspect of, oh my the, you know, the movie, but it's, you know, we're talking about the gun violence, you know, in our country. And then that's still going on in the world. Well, you know, what's fascinating is when I, and I use this analogy that when the twin towers came down, it didn't matter man, woman, color, white, ethnicity, size, you just stood with the person next to you and you grabbed their hand and you prayed, mm -hmm. you know? What would you do if you had a minute to fight for your life and the person next to you was somebody from a country that you didn't like because you were told not to like them? Mm -hmm. What would you do? Would you fight for them? Or would you see them die? That's what the movie's about. You are given a split second to make a decision. So my character, Avi, I relate very much to him because when I was younger, I said to my dad, hey, Papa, I was invited to go model in Europe. And he said, you know, I don't believe in that. So there's one of two choices. You can either stay in my house, as in my early 20s, um, get your degree, stay in college, or you can move out of my house and um, live your pipe dream. So I got up and I moved. I called him a month later and I said, Pop, I'm in Italy. It's great. I love it. I'm learning the language. I have no money. What do I do? And he said, I love you. There's one of two things. You can cash in your ticket, come home, or you can get a job. Got a job. So it's you know, it's very relatable to me because Avi. And, and you lived in Italy and you lived in France and, <laughs> and, and Germany, Germany, right? And I lived in yeah. Germany. I, was, I mean, <laughs> I feel I won. But, you know, yeah, he, I, I definitely think you won. I, that, you know, there's a couple things I regret in life. Not many, but not living abroad was one of them, you know, in college. Alan, get up and go live abroad now. <laughs> yeah, I know. Do the law. I mean, on the Seine. I, I I could, you know, my husband would go in a heartbeat. We should, we should, we'd love to, you know, I would love to, my parents are from Amsterdam. I wish I had lived there at some point. But you still can. Yeah, we can. I know, I, you're I, right. I do it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. How was it filming the movie? Did you have a blast? I, I, I'm not going to say it's a blast. It was the most <laughs> intense. You know, here's what I want to say, though, is, you know, what I'm very respectful of the character I play and my upbringing was I was brought up very old school where a gentleman is a gentleman. You treat a lady with respect. You stand up, you open the door, you say, thank you. And please, you are very chivalrous. Avi is very chivalrous. I love everything about that. And you see that in the movie about him because gone are a lot of the days where gentlemen are as present as they used to be. So one of my missions is to remind a man, stand up, open the door, say thank you, and please be chivalrous. You know, especially in this past year, you know, it's about doing for others. Be kind, open the door. Hey, can I help? Can I do this? Asking more questions. So uh, being that I was brought up that way, it was, um, it was great to portray a character that really exemplifies all of that. And he fights for who he is. Uh, the movie was just super intense. You know, I, I well, spent talk, talk about the, you know, the, the hostage part of it, because, you know, it's somebody suffering from PTSD. And I know mental health is something that you, you know, like to uh, address. Bring light, yes. Address and bring light to. Um, thank you. Uh, the movie is about an ex-Marine who storms an art gallery and he takes all 10 of us as hostages. And he had just come from a precarious situation. He served. Um, and he's suffering from PTSD and he is in utter shell shock and he doesn't know what to do. So his best thinking is to hold all of us as hostages so we can figure out what he's doing. You actually, and what was so genius about shooting the art gallery scene was we shot it in um, a full week in chronological order. So when you actually see these wow. characters in the beginning of the, hey, nice to meet you, and I'm 
doing some flirting with the lead. You, uh, it's genuine and it's authentic. But when you actually see us break, Alan, it is authentic. It is real. It is palpable. Um, wow. There, there are moments where all of us are broken and we are fighting for our lives. So my, my, my thing about all of this is as an adult man, when somebody comes in and I love that the director, Lele Mata didn't tell us this was going to happen. Um, he ordered all of us to get on our hands and our knees. And I remember when we shot that, I went, can I say, I'm like, are you fucking kidding? You're like, what? <laughs> and it wasn't that it, I knew what was happening, but I didn't, it was like, and I remember getting on all fours crawling. And I remember wow. thinking, oh, like, I'm crawling on my hands and my knees. Please don't hurt her. Please don't shoot me. Uh, and I caught that I was doing a nervous thing with counting on my fingers on the floor. And it was my way for me to be present, to not disappear in the fear, but to also think, how can I stay alive? So mm -hmm. it, it's, I invite everyone just to see what that is because you watch adults emotionally break from that fear and my hats off go to my hat hats off to the director Lily Mata for shooting it that way because it's so real. You feel it, you taste it. And uh my godson's brother when he watched it was pacing out of nerves. Well and every and everybody, no matter what in life, you know, under duress reacts a different way. And you you sort of see that in the people lying there. Um how how are you? I mean, going back to what I was saying in regards to this international pandemic, how were you with your direct? And you're you're in New York, yes. I, I'm in New Jersey, but yeah, I w worked in um, New York and was working in New York up until March 11th, and then I knew I was going to get laid off because I worked in tourism, uh, doing marketing and PR, you know, and that was the first thing to shut down and shut down in New York City, and Luckily, I actually started this about two weeks later, just on a whim. It was not something I planned. It was something I was going to do on Instagram. And because of everybody being in the same boat, it took off because everyone was home. Everyone was looking for a way to connect. And I was bringing their favorite daytime. You know, I started with the daytime audience and, you know, I was bringing people who some of the fans hadn't seen in 10, 12 years. So it was, you know, really at a right time when people just needed, because they look at, you know, you, you've you done daytime. They look at daytime as family. They needed, you know, we all needed, you needed to see your family. I needed, you know, I haven't seen my sister since September now, you know, it's crazy, you know? So, you know, I've had this to keep me sort of occupied and, and looking for a job at the same time. So I've, you know, been lucky, but not everybody has something to to occupy that space. But that's but that then goes back to because in a, in a beautiful way. Congratulations, because I uh, when this Thank was presented you. to me, yeah, when you when you found me, <laughs> like, no, I know all about you because it was <laughs> Crystal and Donna Mills. Yeah, and Crystal Donna, done it, and Donna, Donna. It was very nice to have Donna. Donna, I was, had, a, big, I was a big knots landing person, so. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna make. I just had dinner with her last week. Ah, oh, that's awesome. I did. She uh, really. She seems like the sweetest. Oh, she is. You know, I, I love that you wanted to bring people something that they could touch, something that, you know, I don't. And how beautiful that your best thinking was. Let me let me be there for other people, and let me. You know, you found your soap people that you mm -hmm. love. You're asking them. You're then coming into my home, and I'm like. Oh my God. And we'll talk about it. Oh my God. Yes. That's all like Cassidy. I think, okay, good. Oh, well. <laughs> and then for a minute I disappear. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And venues like yours and platforms made me okay this year. I, I got to be on this end where people talked about me and I was lucky for an Emmy non last year and all yeah. of that. But it also allowed me to check in with people that I haven't seen. And it let me know that, hey, they're okay and okay, they're surviving and what are they doing? So um, hats off to you on creating well, this great place for people to come to. Thank you. Well, you know, that's the thing I think about how lucky we all were 
that we were in this global pandemic at a time where this technology allowed you and I to see each other because, you know, families, grandparents, children, you know, you, without FaceTime, without Skype, without Zoom, you know, there'd be a lot of lonely people right now. You know, it would have, I think, it, you know, we'll talk about mental illness. I think the mental issues that this pandemic, you know, arose in people would have been worse without an opportunity to see each other. You know, it would. And I, uh, you know, mental illness has shot up. It used to be one in five adults, I want to say maybe one in seven, you know, and I believe, I truly believe, Ellen, we are all suffering from some form of PTSD. You know, we were living our lives and all of a sudden it stopped. You know, the the organic fear of I can't touch my doorknob. I don't know what's on these groceries. Oh my God, somebody's, like we were, like we still, yeah. we avoid people. There's, there's a bit of shock and awe for me in all of that. And, you know, what you just said about having the Zooms, having the Skypes, and even to the point of, I have an aunt, we've become, not that we weren't close, mm -hmm. we were on the phone for hours, because she doesn't have any of this. She just has her phone, a basic landline that she picks up, and um, hours. I have an older brother, I have an identical twin Lawrence, but an older brother, mm -hmm. then, and we, um, our conversations are different. He just called me a little while ago and wanted to talk to me about, like he wanted my feedback about something with his kid. Hmm. It was like that. So this past year, as much as everything shut down, so much opened up. And that's what we have to look at. The conversations, the questions, the understanding, the, hey, what is this for you? Hey, how is that for you? Hey, let me share this. Um, I believe that it's opened up conversation and hopefully it's opened up our heart more to just be more empathetic to people that are different than we shape sizes, colors, all of it. Let's just be more empathetic to all of it. You know? Yeah. We, we were lacking empathy for a long time. I hope it's, you know, definitely risen a lot. Um, congratulations on winning the uh, award from the film festival for this movie. That's not kind of cool. I, uh, yeah. It's always yeah. nice to win an award that you know nothing about. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So how did, were you, did they do this um, via Zoom or did you, how did you find out about this? I found out about it virtually and uh, writer director of the movie, Lily said, my dear, my dearest Gregory, congratulations. You won outstanding supporting actor um, in a feature film for the Overcome Film Festival. And the supporting actress was a woman I met on the film, Helen Kennedy Turner and we have become very dear friends. Because here's the thing too, you are bonded. I mean, for 10 days, I mean, for a week with 10 people and we are all on the floor with somebody waving a gun and we don't know if we're gonna live or die. You become so bonded, you know that you get to know the good, bad and different, the ugly. And we were all in it together. So I'm very fortunate to have been in that situation with these 10 people. Uh, you know, it's nice when, go back to the stripper pole, I'm on the pole all the time. And, you know, at that moment on that day, they they were they were, they were were throwing some hundred. Yeah, you got a, you, I was just gonna say, you got a hundred dollar bill. No, yeah, I, <laughs> and Ellen, here's what I love. It's kind of like you getting a compliment for this platform. You know, for oh, me to yeah. have the locker room before you invited me on, that's just you doing a great job at what it is. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful that people had overcome in other film festivals because the movies won. We've won outstanding feature in over 10 film festivals and we've won. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, cool. we've won. We've won. Lily's won tons of directing awards. And, and, come, and to get the phone call from her must have been a nice bonus. You know, it if is. She, yeah, and for her to call and, and say won that. Best ensemble in a handful of the awards. And, uh, you know, I love that I got to work with strong actresses in the movie, but Lily's a strong, you know, she's Lebanese. She's a strong writer, director, and she comes from so much life that I hear stories about that I'm like, how did you survive living in war-torn Lebanon? Are you kidding me? You know, my parents told me about things that they survived and I'm in this country 
I believe I'm a guest. I'm an American, my parents were immigrants, so I'm a guest in this country. So it's been very different for me. The worst thing I've ever seen outside of family stuff was the Twin Towers. And, you know, even last year with all that we went through with Black Lives Matter and, you know, celebrate, you know, even now celebrating LGBT and supporting, you know, the Asian culture and all of it and any of it, it's it's been, it's been, it's been so easy compared to everything that my parents and even Lily went through. So to be chosen to tell her story, it's an honor, it's in a gift, and it's um it's a privilege. And uh, I, I'm super grateful that I was chosen to be her Avi. That's amazing. So who or what influenced you on becoming an actor? Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I have my glasses on. I love. Uh, you know, uh, I was a jock in high school, and I was a runner. And my twin and I were. In, he was. He was. Lawrence was the actor. I was the runner, and I was working in a department store. And you know, I took credit acting for credits. And so yeah, I read that Nordstrom's. I love that. So how does that happen? Somebody just comes up to you. Hi, what can I help you with? Can I Can I start a dressing room? for you and uh his name was tom Racina. he was one of the head writers of days of our lives and i really took my job as a sales associate to heart like and again i'm the child of parents that taught me old school so when you come into a department store i used to hear the people would set up dressing rooms so this gentleman tom came in and i pulled the dressing room and i helped him and i said hey let me send your clothes for you let me do this and he said are you an actor and i said sure and the only thing I had ever done on TV really was I was a regular on American Bandstand for five years. Ah, dancing? For five, for five years. Like it was some- my that, first, that would be my dream job. My first show was Sheena Easton, Morning Train. Wow. Modern Boy, come on. Uh, that, that truly, I mean, I love to dance. That would have been my dream job. <laughs> um, he, uh, he said, hey, are you an actor? I said, sure. He said, send me a headshot. So I went. And it was interesting that I had actually, uh, I used to go ice skating with Emma Sands. Uh, yeah. Holly Scorpio from, uh, yeah. and, and then from the Dynasty and the Colbys. Um, she is family. She's she's a love to my twin brother and myself. And I said, hey, I need to hey, see. Fans would love to see her in the locker room. <laughs> would love, I'll, let me let me make a phone call. Um, <laughs> She uh, she introduced me to a photographer that used to shoot. I'm going to give you another name from the blast from the past. Do you remember John Eric Hexham? Yeah. yeah. And this is uh, is that Jag or am I getting the wrong TV show? That's that's James um, something La. John Eric Hexham was the gentleman that accidentally took a prop gun and shot himself. Yes, that that I knew. But I was he trying was, to think what show he was. Oh, I want to say uh, I want to say Voyager something Voyager. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. And that's maybe wrong. But um, I shot with his photographer. So the only headshot I had was a black and white. Um, sent it to the guy. Next thing I knew, I got a phone call and I was on Days of Our Lives for months. And uh, I, you, um, you were right, Voyagers. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. Good for me. <laughs> that was good. You, you pulled that out. And I think the kid's name was, I want to say, Nino Pelusi. That he played, you mean? No, 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 no. The kid, the little kid that played opposite him. I think his oh, name. I've, wow. Well, That's for anybody out there that want to give us that little bit of trivia, we will send. Yeah. You. That's we'll amazing. Send you we'll send you a locker room T-shirt. Oh yeah, there's some a fan did just say the Voyagers and cover up. Oh good. Uh, what well, it was the name of the show as well. Oh, I guess it had two names, maybe. Yay, John Eric Hexum. Say, tell them thank you. And yeah, uh, and yes, it was. Uh, who who did you say the other boy was? Nino Pelusi. Oh, is that right? Uh, the fans will tell us. Okay, that'd be I great. Think, and yeah, I hope no, I, I hope you have locker room T-shirts because I just. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. I would like to. People have asked me that. <laughs> We'll, we'll take care of you. Uh, so long story short, as I was on days, uh, I, I did the best I could. And uh, had you watched any soaps prior to that? Like I watched Luke and Laura's wedding because that's what people did. But I was yeah. never a soap person. It wasn't my like if I like an ex girlfriend would run home and you know you catch it for a second. It wasn't really my gig. Um, mm -hmm. I did 
really know who the characters were. Uh, I got to work with um, Jennifer Aniston's dad, John Aniston, who was lovely. Yeah. And then, you know, like Christian Alfonso, who was Hope. Uh, Missy Reeves, who played uh, Jennifer Amy. Yeah. Oh, I, Jennifer Hort. Yeah, I got, Jennifer Hort. I got to play with some superstars, and you know, I just wasn't ready, and uh, my acting wasn't where it should have been, and I was uh, written off because I wasn't good, and I wouldn't change it for the for the world because that's when I ended up living in Europe for a couple of years, and that's when I had to walk the streets in different markets in different cities, in different countries, to reinvent who I was. I was given a beautiful a beautiful gift. Hey, you're gonna be on a soap opera. And it wasn't that I didn't try and it wasn't that I didn't study. It just wasn't meant to be at that time. So I could have once said, no, I'm done. Or you know what, I'm gonna really break my ass and I'm gonna start putting one foot in front of the other. Um, I'm gonna to go to class, I'm going to do what I can. And the best thinking is, let me start with commercials. And uh, a lot of people I know even today don't like commercials. But to me, commercials are an, ama it's an amazing way to make money. And I was just going to say, it certainly makes a lot of money. You know, when you're making $100,000 just smiling in the camera, and you're also telling a story, I'm not negating any of it, uh, hats off to commercial actors. And then it goes back to you know, as we were saying earlier about daytime stars and daytime soap actors, you know, it is, they are in the trenches seven days a week, sometimes, you know, more than that, even though there's seven days, you know, it's like they put in so much time, you would think there's nine days a week having to put down 20 to 40 to 60 pages of dialogue and make oh, it fresh. Even more today because of uh, trying to, to save a buck. Yeah, to save a buck. Correct. So, it, it, it's, what uh, they're what they're able to do is astonishing. You, and also make it believable. I don't, no. you know, you are invested in these stories. And when these characters are you saying Orla, you know, when Orla is showing, like, because to me, she's magical. But when you watch this woman on screen, you are invested. And you want to find out day to day what she's doing, what her characters are doing, and what happens. And they are, to me, soap opera stars are um, unsung heroes to the craft that we all love. And now I think finally, because there's so much digital drama out there and so much more on internet and um, streaming platforms, they are finally getting their due and they're finally getting yeah. their- Getting yeah. yeah. more respect. Absolutely. Yeah, they deserve, they deserve it. How did Venice come about for you? Uh, Nadia Bjorlin, who plays Chloe on yeah. his lives, uh, had a crush on her because I'm like, you are one of the most beautiful women. She I've is a beautiful woman. Life. Like, I know it's awkward, but can I stare at you? Um, <laughs> her her uh, eyes are, you know, crazy. Are you, like, like, it's creepy to say to somebody, can I stare at you? But then you're also indulging yourself. Like, listen, you can be awkward, but I'm just going to stare. Um, <laughs> we became very, very close and I met her future husband and we used to, have dinners and hang out. And then she invited me to the wedding. Uh, after my day's run, I ended up forming a crush on Crystal Chappelle. Um, <laughs> I love that. I, I really dig strong women. You know, Talk my, about talent. Whew. You know, but here's the thing. She is, she's for me, one of the most beautiful women I've ever met. Yeah, Crystal's beautiful. And she's also ballsy. She's edgy, I'm gonna say this like a broad, and she just, you feel every word. So at her wedding, I was with Lawrence, and I said, oh my God, that's Crystal Chappelle. Like, it's my Carly. <laughs> she was with her husband, Michael Sabatino, and Lawrence knew how to crush on her, and he said, Crystal. And she came over and I said, hi, and I smiled, <laughs> and couldn't really talk to her. We took photos, she was super sweet. Uh, I was in high school again for two seconds, and I just <laughs> said to her, uh, I know you have a show called Venice Series. If uh, you ever come across somebody that may look like me, uh, I'd love to be on your show. A year and a half later, I got an email to be um, I love Detective it. Nick Fander, season five. Um, 
it was a dream and a joy. And as an actor in my uh, season to interrogate her character was just heaven. Because once again, it's, she's so beautiful and she's also so talented. So talented. Um, I, watched, I watched that scene on your reel on your website. Well, she, I got befuddled and that really dictated the character because when she delivered those lines, I went, okay, like you're like, and it was authentic. Like you, and that to me, that's real acting. Like when you were actually sharing that part, um, it was so, so fun that she invited me for season six and I played um, Nick's twin brother, Nate. And that's where I got to meet the amazing Orla and she was my boss and her character was bullied. She bullies me and my character's bullied with his twin brother. And it's this beautiful dance and it's beautiful storytelling and it's a great game of tennis. And when somebody serves you a beautiful serve, how are you going to return it? And uh, yeah, were you nominated for your scenes with Orla or I who? Was. It was That's just, great. here's the great part. Uh, my nomination submission was barely over four minutes of the same scene. And it was a pre-nomination and there was close to 800 submissions last year. And to make it in the top five, and I'll say it, when you as an actor get to work with someone like Orla Cassidy, they raise your game <laughs> because it really is just authentic call and respond and telling story. And we were so genuine, we only did this, we did the take twice. And it was so real and so authentic. To date, it's some of the best stuff I've ever done. Wow, that's great. Who directed yeah. it, do you remember? Uh, Crystal. Crystal. Oh, she did. That's uh, great. It was Crystal and Hillary. Hillary B. Smith was, you know, they're an amazing team. Again, two were, women. I, I've had the two of them together. In you the, have? In the, yeah, here in the locker room. They were, they're were they a great duo, a talented duo. My God. Oh. Because uh, I've watched, I mean, I worked with Crystal on Guiding Light, but I actually grew up watching Hillary on As the World Turns. Wow. And she, before she went to One Life to Live, where she had been forever, but she played a great character on As the World Turns. That, I mean, she had some, she's a powerhouse. They, they both are. They, they all are. Orla, Hillary. I mean, everyone actually, you know, there's a lot of people on Venice who, you know, came from Guiding Light and As the World Turns. But I mean, Crystal has put a talented group together in that show. Jessica Lucia. Yeah, she uh, she she uh, she's a yeah. I love my Jessica. Uh, you know what I love about them? They're all very New York. Uh, you got no no shit, no bullshit, just pretty direct. Um, and let's get the job done. So, yeah, but it's also solid, <laughs> you know. And they raise they raise my game out. And they they truly, you know, when you're working with people that raise your bar. I don't want to say it's a competition, but you want to meet that vibration. So when you have Orla Cass for me, Orla Cassidy sitting in my scene and she's mm -hmm. drinking a cup of coffee, but she's, it's more than a cup of coffee. She is, her character is rehashing her life. The storyline is all about bullying. And, you know, it allowed me to talk in a broader platform last year because of online bullying and pandemic and you know what to do and how to step away from bullying. And it got me involved in a great charity called free to love. You, you're not just saying words with someone like Orla, you are pulling out magical moments that somebody's given you. It's this beautiful, again, like in yoga uh, in enchanting, it's a call and respond. So, you call and there's a response and it just, um, it's this seamless storytelling. I, I don't know if I'm giving it justice in the words that I'm saying, but they, they make me a better actor. They, they very, and I was proud that when I was able to say that I was nominated for an Emmy for this love story called Venice series, uh, I dedicated it a lot to Crystal and Hillary as a thank you. Um, but Orla, you know, had it been somebody else, maybe the, the stakes weren't as high. But she and, is, yeah, 
I mean, you, you might not have had that tennis partner. Touche. Uh, <laughs> do, you know, do you know Terry Ivins? I know that name. Uh, she's in the movie with me. Uh, she was on All My Children, and she oh was, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's on I the bay. It. She's yeah. on the bay. She's she's a powerhouse. But what was great about her? She says fine acting is like two actors in a duel fencing. Yeah. And it's just there's a precision. There's a there's a bit of a manipulation. There's a bit of a you know. And I love that analogy as well because you you know you want to get into the ring with somebody that is going to really get into the ring. And uh, I, I I heard it's coming back season season um, seven. Se yeah, I saw yeah. Crystal just prom I just saw her promote it. Tell me about Free to Love. You know, Free to Love. Thank you for that. Free to Love is um, it's an organization that was started by somebody that I have known for a very long time. We uh, grew up together, and it's just about um, it's creating a safe place for the LGBT community. Um, and, I, and I've and i opened that up a bit to kids and teens that are suffering with, with self-acceptance, their own identity. Um, you just gave me an idea. Tell um, me. Because I, well, I want to, I, you know, June being Pride Month, I did one show last year for Pride, but I, I've been trying to figure out what I want to do this year for Pride. And I might want to get, I might reach out to them I used to volunteer for the Trevor Project, which I know you've done work with. I was a very, lifeline. very much involved with them. I was a lifeline counselor for uh, about two years. To you? Yeah, I, I had to give it up because I moved out to New Jersey. So doing it in the evening in, in the city was just too hard to get home right. after. But, um, you know, for somebody who grew up in the 80s, you know, when it was a, a very different time, sure. I just, you know... I, I still think these conversations are important. So you just gave me an idea of maybe getting, you know, free to love the Trevor project and maybe the Ali Forney center, which is for uh, homeless LGBT youth together. Um, I, I will do every intro I can. I'm, I'm yeah. very proud to be an ambassador for them because, you know, you know, it's interesting. A lot of people and thank you for the lives that you saved because I don't, and it goes back to what we were saying earlier. It's just a little conversation because most people that are dealing with lack of self and sexual identity, they think they're on their own. And, you know, when bullying happens, you are on your computer and people are coming at you, calling you names, doing all these things. And I think for me, it was Tyler Clementi that, okay. you know, really, you know, because I was bullied as a, you know, I was bullied. I at a time when I didn't know, you know, what, what I was, you know, so it's, yeah, it's, and I can't even imagine. I so thankful you and I did not grow up with this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what's this to stop? I don't, I have two nephews, 12 and 10. And I just say to them, if you are bullied, just get off your laptop, please. If you are being bullied unfollow, unfriend, get, you know, the two, strongest things we have are our feet, get up and walk away. Um, don't engage, you know, uh, when I was doing statistics last year, you know, it is it is a global epidemic. Um, people, online bullying, that's, it's tragic, it's sad, it's, you know, people think they're really strong behind a computer screen. Of course you do, because there's no ramifications about it. So you can say all these horrible things, but the important thing for anybody that's being bullied is to realize that they are not alone. It happens all the time and that there's solutions and outs. So with free to love, that's all it is. It's all about just love. And Tanya, who I've known for a long time, created this platform and she has been married and has kids and is this amazing mom. And it's this respect for each other because she, doesn't want this generation to suffer the way that she did or yeah. others have, or we have. And um, yeah, there's some really, really great people. Lisa Kudrow is one of the ambassadors. Um, my Mbalik is an ambassador. I'm an ambassador. And it's just about going, hey, I got you. Because if you have that once that you were a counselor, Trevor, all somebody needs to know is they are not alone. And it stops like, okay. Okay, okay, I promise you I'm gonna call you in the morning. 
Um, you know what I'm saying? It's just you. It gives you something that's tactile. So hats well, off. For that. You know, I, we're not going to go down this road of political, but thank God the biggest bully is no longer in power because you know that was sending the wrong message to kids. Oh, I don't. When your nephew says something, well, Uncle Gregory, because, you know, Donald Trump does X, Y, and Z, how do you feel about that? And I always would say, just because somebody does X, Y, and Z doesn't mean it's right. Right. How, how does that feel to you? You know, um, he is a bully. And, and Alexander, what I say about that is walk away from bullies. Because if nobody is listening to the bully, yeah. they're by themselves. So, well, that, that, you know, that's, you know, that's the only thing I will say. I mean, I'm th thankful we don't necessarily hear the bully anymore because I think, you know, it was a dangerous message for young kids to see something like that. Um, it created a narrative that was so harmful and it created a narrative. And here's the thing. I think a lot of the stuff was underlying. I think a lot of the suppression was was held under but when you turn the flame on it's the pot's gonna blow and when you have somebody that is poking a bear this country the world it's gonna blow and i'm grateful that we don't have to see it every day anymore and i'm grateful that there's a level of kind that has come back. I'm grateful that a few days well, ago. You used the word perfectly earlier, empathy. Yeah, there's, you know, we, we got it right a few days ago. It's not okay to put your knee on someone's neck. I don't care right. who you are, especially when you're in a position of, when you're a police, you're, you do that to anybody. You're supposed so. to save our lives. True. You know, protect, save and protect. So within all of that, it goes back to what we started with Alan. It's about, it's a conversation. Like, you know what, I'll say this. One thing uh, that I really appreciate that last year gave me is the inquiry to ask questions. And social media, I think, can be wonderful. My nephew, Alexander, he listens to everything my twin and I do. Like, Uncle Gregory, I'm proud of you for the Emmy. And Uncle, you know, <laughs> that my twin brother does. And a year ago, I did an Instagram Live right after... Um, during the Black Lives Matter movement. And it was with a gentleman named Terrence Terrell. And he had won the Emmy the year before that I was nominated for. And um, he is on Be Positive now and he's super talented. And he gets on and I get on and I said, okay, let's just address the elephant in the room. Um, I am white, you are black. We, we giggle. And I said, let me just start right here. And he goes, what? And I said, what do I say? Do I say African-American? Do I say black? Tell me what is appropriate. And he said, black. I like black. And I went, great. Because here's the truth. We can come up with all these colors. You know what I'm saying? We can say chocolate, coat, whatever. But mm -hmm. hey, let me ask you what works best for you. And then at the very end of this amazing conversation, because again, my 12-year-old nephew was listening. I said, let me now address the N-word. And he went, and I said, here's my question. I'm in a spin class. The, the instructor, I'm beautiful black girl, we're friends, her brother, black. They were playing the song and the word, the N word is being hammered in the song. If I walk outside and I'm still singing the song, I get called out for singing a word that is in a song. Mm. What do I do? Like, help me here. Because I'm not being offensive. I just, it's a song and I'm, he said, just don't say the word. I don't say the word. I'm a black man. I don't say the word. And I said, it's all I had to know. Thanks. How do we know if we don't ask? You know, you, you wouldn't know this, but um, so my parents were Holocaust survivors and uh, I wanted to do something because I, I knew there was the rise of anti-Semitism and hate and racism. So I've created a little sub-series using the word that you keep saying, conversation, and it's called Conversations with Alan. And it's really about that because the conversations just educate us. You and I just having this, well, you just sharing that is going to educate someone else about all of these, the bullying, Black Lives Matter, all of these subjects. It, it's not something I ever really thought of, but it, it, it really is 
just about communication in all levels, you can help teach someone by just having a conversation with them. And you can pass that on. You know, I don't, you know, politically, I think you and I are aligned. My, uh, my parent, my dad, when he got to this country, uh, there was a Republican in office. So my father was very much a staunch Republican. He actually became a very big politician. When he passed away years ago, he was um, the most celebrated Armenian American politician in the country. So the state wow. capitals, a majority of them held their flags at half mass, posted a photo of my parents with Ronald Reagan. And I remember people came after me and there was one specific person and we got on the phone and I just said, what are you doing? And he goes, well, look what he did and with HIV and AIDS and all of this in the church. And I said, got it. I am not negating it. When AIDS first hit, I lost a handful of my very best friends. So I get it. Let me tell you a little story. My mom survived World War II in Berlin, Germany. She watched my grandmother beaten up and raped by somebody. So over a train and their luggage. My mm -hmm. grandfather was drafted into the Nazi party. My grandfather said, kiss my ass, lived underground in Poland with his parents. So my grandparents and my mom were so anti all of that. They're like, no, my mom grew up with that. She then still lived living in Berlin. The wall goes up. Her entire life changed as she knew it. The day the wall came down, I happened to be in Berlin, Germany. I looked my mom in the eyes and she started sobbing because the country that she grew up in was whole again. So who are you to tell me? And Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. We all have a story. Tell me your story. Tell me what that is. You know, people assume that because I'm half German, it was one way. No, why don't you ask me what it was? Right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, uh, you know, I'll be honest. Sadly, I, you know, my mother was n not a fan of Germans. You got know, it. right. And I can it, tell you, it, I got it. Uh, you know, I get it. I, you know, she didn't like me going to, to, you know, on vacation there. Didn't like, you know, us flying, you know, I, I, it took me a long time to understand all of that. And that's, you know, I was going to do one show about sort of the rise of anti-Semitism. And someone just said to me, you have a platform now, why would you do one? And so that's why I'm trying to do those conversations. If they help one, I've done you know, I've done something really positive. You keep talking about Lawrence. I want to ask a twin brother. What is that like growing up with? Here, let me show you. Hold on. <laughs> oh, are you going to be dressed the same? Oh, <laughs> there we are. Amazing. That's a great picture. Isn't it? I, I can't tell who's who. I'm the good looking one. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it's all I know. You know, we, uh, it's all I know. I don't know anything different. Uh, we, but did you have fun? With, did you have some fun with it? We still do. Oh, we have, we have such a great time. But here's the thing. We were, my parents were really young. My mom, you know, was in her early twenties and my dad was mid twenties when we came, they didn't know they were having twins. Um, our heartbeats were at the same time. Together we were nine pounds, so they thought it was just one. We ended up having two. Uh, we were brought up as the twins, so it was Lawrence and his twin brother. So we, I had a bit of an identity crisis because I was the and the. You know, he was, we have an older brother, Vincent, so it's Vincent. Well, so did Lawrence come out first? He did, seven minutes. Okay. Enough time for wow. my mom to get a cigarette and a shot. Um, <laughs> did she know at that time she was having another? She had no idea because I was so high, um, they didn't know they were having twins. Um, you know, wow. my parents did the best they could. And, you know, Lawrence and I are identical twins in the same business and every day somebody chooses one or the other. And for a long time, I, I booked the soap opera. Lawrence was the actor. Um, when I came back from Europe, uh, I started booking tons and tons of commercials and Lawrence would go out and audition, but he wasn't booking any because people are like, oh no, we love Gregory. Um, I was so busy in a chunk of time that Lawrence would fill in for me. 
Um, and it was working until it didn't. And he just felt like I need my own identity. And he then created, I mean, he is a celebrated lifestyle expert. He has been yeah. doing this for over 25 years. Um, he is finishing his run on home and family um, at Hallmark. He is a regular on the Kelly Clarkson show. Together, we are lifestyle experts on the Rachel Ray show. I, uh, I saw I saw your appearance on Kelly. Come big, big, on, uh, that's Kelly Clarkson. She is one of the coolest ladies. She and one of the best voices out there. In a moment like this, <laughs> um, she to have me on her show. Thank you, Lawrence. And then the executive producer, Alex Duda, is a very good friend of ours. And to kind of punk Kelly, to surprise her the way we did. Yeah, that was great. But then to have her open up the conversation about mental health, mental illness, and then have the show pay it forward to have a $1,000 donation go to Wounded Warrior Project through Pilot Pens. And they were celebrating twins that do great things. You know, you, Alan, Mike Lawrence and I, you and I, we are given platforms to talk. You know, sometimes on my Instagram lives, I may get three people, but one out of those three people may make a $5 donation to Free to Love. We are given opportunities to just make this world a better place and to, you know, most of my conversations are directed to my nephews. You know, I want them to live in an open world where they ask questions they they want to know they are little gentlemen and even if it gets hard messy or heartbreaking they learn from what the experience is and if i can give them a little bit every day or a little bit on what we're doing or other things that i've done then as their uncle and as a man i'm doing the right thing i mean that truly beautiful same thing for you. I don't, you know. Yeah, I have to, I, you, you keep saying it. I also have two, you know, they're in their twenties. Um, and, and you're right. You know, like this show sort of, you know, the audience built because of the daytime community and that those other shows that I do conversations with Alan, they don't get what, you know, these actor and celebrity shows get, but I am just doing it because like you said, if one person if it enlightens one of them, I, I, I'm doing it. And it's also for me, you know, like my, it took me a long time to grasp what my parents had, had lived through. And so it, it, it is a way for me to honor that because also I would not be here if the people who risked their lives to save them, I wouldn't be able to do this. If, if people stepped up, they stepped up to the plate, hid them away. And uh, I'm still close with, you know, the people who hid my mom's family away. You know, I, uh, I was in Berlin a couple of years ago working on uh, the show um, Counterpart. And, you know, my grandfather, he was a badass, you know, to, yeah, to, to, to be told that you have to be part of this regime and basically say, can I cuss here? Yeah, you did already, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so basically, that's say fuck off. Yeah. Realize that's not who he was, and to take my grandma and my mom. I mean, his brother was shot at gunpoint, a Bavarian um, forest ranger. Like, I lost family because he, they he, said, he, they he could have, he, he said, said no, right. Yeah. He said no, he could have lost his life. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. But to grow up in Berlin, Germany, to be with my grandparents, to have this country separated by a wall, to then go back two years ago to film an amazing show with Lawrence, to then go back home to be where I grew up. Wow. It, and then to know that Berlin, puts they put gold stars at the doorsteps, gold rocks at the doorsteps of the people that were taken. To, did you know that? No. That when you would go, that they tried to commemorate every person that was taken, that they would put stones um, in front of the in front of the thresholds, to and their name is on it to commemorate the life that was lost. Wow. To to see that, to be part of that, and to 
mourn that, but also celebrate that people are doing it differently. You know what I'm saying? To yeah. go, no, this can't happen again, but we're going to do this now and we're going to celebrate and commemorate the life that was lived, that the life was lost, but also commemorate the life lived. You know, it's, I was proud to experience that and to, I kissed every time I came across one, I kissed my hand and I put it on there and I just said, thank you. Because we, we all have a story and to be my mother's child, to know that I was taught the right way, then it, grateful. But that's, that, that lesson that you just said right there though, it is, I think everything is about being taught, you know, hatred is taught, uh, you know, to, to hate a gay person, a black person, an Asian person is taught. It is not something we are born. We are not born to hate. We are not no, born are, to hate. No. We are born being loved and lovable. The only yeah. thing that changes is the story that we're like, oh, you, you're not supposed to like them. I mean, my, again, my parents were immigrants. So in the comp the company that my, my dad, mine too, you know, mine too, yeah. You know, my we there there was um, a Jew, a Mexican, a white guy, and a black guy. So I was brought up with all the colors in the cran box, <laughs> yay! And we were taught, yeah, color means it, nothing. color means nothing. Correct, and, and it yeah, it, it definitely. I want to ask because one of the fans, Stephen, wrote. You talk, Stephen talked about the great episode you did of Entourage. He was curious as to what the entire process is that they use on putting a scene together, um, blocking and rehearsal act aspect of filming the scenes that you did. Uh, worked with Jeremy Piven and Rex Lee. Uh, I knew Rex socially. Uh, I had interviewed and then I didn't get the job until like months later. So I was like, wait, what did I do? Um, we shot across the street from the Pantages Theater. Um, Rex and I were there first. So I was loosely blocked. And then um, Jeremy came in. Um, and then we were specifically blocked. And what I want to say about them was they're just really solid actors. I mean, I don't know how many Emmys did Jeremy win. And Rex is yeah. a pro because he knew exactly that he was the sidekick. So that's, you know, when you're the sidekick, you make them look great. Uh, generous, kind, we did it twice and we were done. And out of all the jobs I've done, I get stopped. Entourage is one of them. Like Interesting. It, yeah, uh, like, oh my God, what was he like? And did you get anything from my older brother? <laughs> like, dude, you're on Entourage. It makes me cool. I'm like, I know. You know, uh, an important it is, it is, it is like that. Cool. I mean, Westworld though, you, you've got to get noticed for too. I mean, that's, that's, you know, it's sort of like the, not, I mean, it's very different than entourage, but it's, you know, it's in the hip factor that the kids talk about. I, uh, I'm still surprised that I'm part of the Westworld family. Th two, uh, two episodes. Did you ever watch the original movie? Uh, before the HBO, before the HBO series, oh, go back. Oh, I will. There's a movie called Westworld, starring Yul Brynner, James Brolin, and Richard. What? Benjamin. Oh no, 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 um, Alan. There is a. <clears throat> uh, I mean, right there, those three. Holy oh, cow! There is an homage to the robot that Yul Brynner played in the movie, in um. Anthony Hopkins um, laboratory per se. It's it's genius. The beautiful part of that is Richard Benjamin and his wife Paula Prentice are really good friends of mine. So I got to ask him questions about the uh, making of the movie and he said that they had no idea that it was gonna be the international phenomenon that it still is today. Um, you know, it's, it's on the same set that I shot Counterpart. So it was kind of like coming home. Uh, there, it's Vincent Cassell, Tessa Thompson. Uh, it's Jennifer Getzinger was my director, and then Jonah Nolan, the creator of it, who is 
he's so awesome uh, to be part of that and let them, you know, here's one thing I want to say though, is a lot of people think that when you have really big stars, they have other people do their line delivery and give you the, you know, the over camera shot and stuff like that. Uh, on my last day, Tessa Thompson was sick. She left her trailer to come back to give me my eye line for like over an hour because we were redoing shots. You told the story that Madeline Stowe did that for you on Revenge too. Oh. <laughs> here's my Mad. This is my Madeline Stowe. Yeah, but here's the thing. It's that I love that. That was a fantastic it's, show. It's a consummate. I show up at five a.m. to set, and this is all I got. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Madeline Stowe, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Eighteen hours later, she looked. She said to the director, "I just want to make sure that I give Gregory my." the right eye line. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Me for, you know, Joe Montaigne, who was on Criminal Minds, thanked me in a broad spectrum for all the actors that come into a show that is polished. It's a well-oiled machine that they have a rhythm. And he celebrated actors like me and others that come in for guest stars or co-stars that have to bring in this story in one or two days. Because showing up on a show that is so successful and having to tell a story in your episode, it's a lot more than people think. So mm -hmm. we uh, we work really hard to be part of the fabric of that great show. So I uh, he really commemorated that. And it made me appreciate more that when I do audition, when I do get a job, that it doesn't fall on death ears, that people actually do appreciate it and do go, hey, you know what? Thank you for being here. That's great. I mean, it, you know, you don't always find it, but to have a good set is just so important. Hey, I got to tell you that, well, first of all, Nancy was confused because she's like, are you on Home and Family or is that your brother? But she, but, um, I'm glad I'm I'm sort of looking at some of the comments. People were happy to hear us having the earlier conversations, the important stuff, and uh, were thanking us for doing so. Um, congratulations to you on 15 years of sobriety. How do you make it, how does it work for you? One blink at a time. Mm. You know, they say one day at a time, it's one blink at a time. I don't know. Um, I think it's the best ticket in town. And I think in a beautiful way, it, it's with everything that we're talking about. You know, you sit in a meeting and you tell your story. If you're a speaker at a meeting, you are telling, you know, what it was, what it was like and how you're doing it differently. You know, I used to drink and do drugs for a long time and it just didn't work anymore. And, uh, did, was it was it a moment for you or did somebody have to help you realize that or, you know, a light bulb went off or. I had been part of Al-Anon. It's another recovery program. Yeah. And I was so, uh, you know, my mom had died. And I remember when I was going to Al-Anon, I blamed God. Like, if you're so powerful, God, why would you? And my mom was my mom was it for me. You know, I. I was, you know, my mom loved her boys, you know, it was a mom and her three boys and losing a parent, Gregory, S-U-C-K-S sucks big time. I've lost both. So me, me I, too. Okay. So we are now hugging and <laughs> yeah, you know, and for anybody that loses a parent, you know, uh, they're like, how do you go on? And I just, I talk to them more. I, I hmm. close my eyes and I feel them in a different way. I, feel each of them touching my face. I get a whiff of something or a moment of them. Um, she died. I was pissed off at God. Um, my drinking and drugging got bad. And I remember my sponsor in Al-Anon, I was just so t tired of hearing her tell me that I, because she said, come with me to an A meeting. I'm like, oh. <laughs> and every time I would call her three times a week with gratitudes. And this one night I was really drunk and I just thought, I don't have it in me to lie anymore. So I met her at a meeting. It was at um, the Virgin Megastore. And I remember um, 
sitting and I was shaking and I was still drunk from the night before and did the meeting. And I remember walking to my car and I fell to my knees and I just started crying and I thought, I can't do this anymore. And it, you know, I, my biggest gratitude of all of this is I never hurt anybody. I never killed anybody. I, the only person that I ever physically hurt was myself. Um, I fell off my couch and I broke my face, broke my nose. Um, you're, you're describing a friend of mine sounds exactly like a friend of mine who had been through it. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, being sober is the most personal thing I do every day. Um, it is a dance with me and God. Um, when people, and I used to smoke two packs a day for over 20 years. Uh, when they ask me now, how do you say sober? How do you not? Um, I breathe really deeply. I scream if I have to. I talk when I need to. I pray all the time. And I would, re and here's the thing we all know that when we get messy, we all know that when we get, and I'll say it emotionally or mentally suicidal, we all know when our big bad is bad. We all know when we want the voices to stop. It, it's more important for me not to drink than it is to drink. I, uh, as here's the thing, getting up and lighting a cigarette is a choice, getting up and pouring a cocktail is a choice, not having a cigarette, not having a drink or doing crystal meth is a choice. And as trivial as that sounds to some, it's a choice. And as hard as it may be, it's a choice. And I'll say to anybody that you have out there that needs help with sobriety meetings, whatever, find me. I will absolutely listen. I will absolutely say, hey, let me guide you to some meetings. Let me let me help you. It goes back to what we're talking about, sexuality, fear, not wanting to be around. There are so many beautiful avenues where someone is saying, here, let me help you. And I, I believe that one of my reasons for being here and me not dying from all of that I've talked about is um, to be there for someone else and make a choice and help them make a stronger choice and uh, be something that they can touch and go, okay, I got, you got me for a minute. I could sit here for hours with you and someday we will have a drink. Just, I, not I, a drink, I, but, I, you I'm know, a coffee hungry. drink. I don't mean an alcohol drink. But Chase said, I'm grateful for both of you guys sharing such needed knowledge. From my being sober for 33 years, I'm so grateful to Gregory. That's incredible. Thank you, Chase. Best ticket in town. And I just want yeah. to say this, because I know we've, you know, I think it's the best ticket in town because here's why. All you're doing is talking. You know, my older brother, Vincent, isn't the biggest talker. He called me today and he said, dude, this hurts me. This is bothering me. And I just said, I love you. Thank you. Because that's all it is. You know, I want the voices to stop. I'm mm -hmm. afraid I'm this, I'm that. Yeah. Once you get it out, you can then put it somewhere. You know, uh, it's, it's a solution. You know, journal, talk to God, scream in your pillow, take 10 deep breaths. A craving lasts less than three minutes. Have a glass of water. You know what I'm saying? There's so many solutions. We just get wrapped up in what it isn't instead of going, wow, I can do this differently. I, I, I'm going to leave it on that note, but I want to know what's next. I know you're producing a movie, right? Yeah, I'm part of a horror flick. Yay. And then I'm um, day have you, pro have you produced before? I did. I, I was... Um, Great love story. If you guys want to see a great love story, it's called From Zero to I Love You. It's a Doug Spearman film. It was out last year. Um, Daryl Stevens, who's now part of um, Be Positive on NBC, Scott Bailey, Keely Lefkowitz. Maybe. Scott Bailey. Love He's Scott a friend Bailey. of mine. Love Scott Bailey. Um, I produced that. Um, oh, awesome. And I'm also part now of... Uh, oh, is that the movie He's in? Yeah. Yes. I wanted to see that. Where can I find that? I wanted to I'm watch that. Screaming. It's on streaming services. I it is. 
Prime. I'm gonna look. I'm. I. I need to <laughs> write that down when we're done. I'm. Please, I, I have wanted to see that. What you think. I will absolutely. I play a fucker. Oh. Hey, it's fuckers good, are good. Really good. Um, <laughs> and then I'm part of um, Dade Alza, who plays Travis in 86 Melrose Avenue. Uh, created uh, Mystery Incorporated. It is a take on Scooby Doo, and I am um, Shaggy's father. So it's that's amazing. Awesome. I, I wanted you to tell that because I had uh, heard that. So that's fantastic. That sounds great. You know, can I can so, I do one thing, Alan? I just want to play yeah. 86 Melrose Avenue. Yeah, of course. It is. I invite all of you to watch it. It is confronting. And because it is so confronting, um, we talk about gun violence, gun control. There's a staggering statistic at the end of the movie that people that are pro-guns do not like. I get it. I actually took a picture of that, actually. Um, it's a staggering fact. It was um, yeah. pulled from the um, US Cens Census Bureau because I wanted to make sure that I knew exactly what that was. The movie makes you question your own mortality. And it also uh, makes you look at things like, what I didn't do, did I Did I not call this person? Am I hanging on to this? If you have one second to make a choice, what are you gonna choose? And it just makes you look at life differently. And it opens up, because I think in the full circle we've talked about, is it just opens up your world to conversation and being empathetic and open to other people of shape, sizes, walks, color. So that's what we want to talk about. We want to talk about PTSD. We're all suffering from it. We all have mental health issues, as I was talking about with my alcohol. I'm not afraid of it anymore. We shouldn't be afraid of conversations that are uncomfortable. We should be afraid of the fact that we're not talking about it. That's where the fear comes from. Correct. 100%. 100%. Go see 86 Melrose Avenue. Gregory, I hope to meet you in person one day. This was really, you're, you're a delight to speak to. Thank you for having me. And yes, please um, reach out to Alan and he will send you the locker room t-shirts. <laughs> Have a great weekend. So Take nice to meet pleasure. you. Pleasure. So nice. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thank you, Gregory, for, for being here. Um, don't forget, I... I I want to remind everybody that The Locker Room is partnering with SoapCon Live to bring your favorite daytime stars to your living room with free live panels beginning May 1st. Visit SoapConLive.com for all the details, information on the meet and greets, autographs, and uh, video messages that you can have with your favorite daytime star. And remember, if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, you can do so below. Just turn on the notification so you're reminded of all upcoming shows. Have a great weekend, everybody. See you next week.